at this, as we're talking today in a moment when um, there's a lot of controversy over uh, some prominent politicians who have been participants in blackface. Um, and as we're talking about forms of, of aggression and offensive symbolism, talk a little, and, and again, there are people who would want to minimize that. Uh, they were young or what's the big deal? As a person of color, talk about why that is so problematic mm -hmm. and the, the history of that and why it is not simply a act of youthful indiscretion. For me, as not only a person of color, but someone who identifies as a black woman, um, seeing people engaged in black faces, not only um, like a joke or a mistake or misstep, but it's um, very harmful and a, a huge um, action of disrespect and dehumanization. I remember, um, I'm originally from Indiana, and I remember um, playing sports. And for the, the first part, the first 16 years of my life, I lived in Gary, Indiana, which is a predominantly black city. Um, at 16, we moved to central Indiana, and there was more diversity in terms of more white people to the ratio of black folks. And so as we would play in different athletic contests and travel to more conservative towns where there are less and less people of color in those spaces, it was common to see murals of Confederate flags or Confederate soldiers in the gym. And um, where students and community members would gather in blackface because they knew our school was coming. Um, as a way to intimidate and dehumanize us and to throw us off of our game. And so um, for me, it's not just about something fun or an easy mistake, but it's a way to reassert white supremacy and um, to condemn folks and to say you are inferior and will make a mockery of you. Mm -hmm. And how did you, how did you respond? Were you part of a team at the time? I was part of a team. How did, how did the team respond to that when it, when it happened? We struggled um, to win, and so it does have an impact. Sure. Um, but whether it's blackface or folks competing and fans from opposing teams are yelling out racial slurs, um, it's hurtful. And, it's, and I think that the, the hard part is to know that we're still dealing with these things in 2019 and that people still don't understand the huge ramifications that it has. And so while folks are um, making the statement that they're not racist or that these were things that happened in the past, I think that it takes, I think that there's opportunities for us to think about what do we do with this? How do we hold people accountable? How do we send the signal to students who are in college now about what the potential consequences might be if they engage in this behavior now for their lives in the future. Um, while there are these politicians that had this happen, we've seen these things happen on our college campuses today. A lot. Uh, yeah, whether it's blackface or brownface. Confederate flags, Confederate, Confederate statues. Flags, all of that, you know, and so, um, and thinking that it's just a joke. And so I think that it's gonna be important for us who are the, the keepers of the, the community here to think about how do we educate students and help them move forward so that they can be more aware and think about the ways they show up in spaces and what that does and the dynamics. We're living in, um, I don't know if it's increasingly um, diverse world. I think the world is pretty diverse, but I think our connections to it are increasing. And we need to prepare them to think about how they're going to lead effectively with, between, across difference. And um, if they go into those dynamics um, with superiority or inferiority complexes, we're maintaining a very, very problematic status quo. Uh, Donna, thank you uh, for sitting down with me. Thank you for asking. Uh, I want to talk with you about uh, both a conversation I had recently and then a discovery that we made recently. Uh, a few days ago, I sat down with 
Dr. Marjorie Trueblood, who's our Dean of uh, Multicultural Life. And one of the things we talked about was blackface and its impact and its history, uh, provoked in part by what's going on right now in Virginia. And after that conversation, we did some research into McAllister's own history. Uh, and with the help of our wonderful archivist, uh, Ellen Holt Worley, uh, we discovered not, not many images, uh, but a handful uh, between about 1910 and 1949. Uh, a few in individual scrapbooks, uh, one on the front page of the Mac Weekly. Uh, depicting students in blackface at McAllister. Uh, I'm wondering, first of all, if, if that discovery surprises you. Not at all. Um, I, those kinds of images were rampant, and the uh, kinds of cultures that they represented were um, created throughout the United States. And I'm not a historian, but um, I've seen enough of these not to be surprised that they were here, too. And so how should we, sitting here in 2019. How should we think about, for instance, an image from 1949? Uh, should, how should we process it? What should we learn from it? How should we react to it? I think that it's really good to think about the context of the, of the images themselves. That it's not just that there was an image that was created in the past that was um, offensive to some people and not offensive to others. And then in 2019, it's offensive to some and not others. But that the images themselves carry meaning across time and that those meanings are associated with other practices that were going on at the time. So it's not random that th there are certain images associated with certain populations in the United States. Mm -hmm. but And those images that are dehumanizing um, served a purpose, and so that they were very prevalent during the times of enslavement. There was a, um, I guess, images helped to make that practice okay to some people and by dehumanizing the people that were enslaved. And so after the period of formal enslavement, those meanings don't go away, but they carry forward. And so the conversation now needs to be about the meanings that are carried by those images and how they impact people currently that are not just about feelings of um, being offended or something, but that they're reproducing a kind of subordination that has roots in the past. So what would you say to students or to faculty confronted with these images or with this knowledge of our own institutional history about how we should most productively think about it, work with it, understand it, talk about it in 2019? It grieves me that we still have to be talking about this and that it's not just that they are these negative images that have this impact, but that um, you do a, an interview with Marjorie Trueblood, the Dean of, the, of Multicultural Life, and we sit here and need to talk about it rather than really thinking about the transformative work that's being done in the DML mm -hmm. and that um, the ways that the DML for decades has really been a place that um, enables people to think differently about the relationship of different peoples and um, what that can mean for the college to d dive into that more deeply and that it w when we are drawn back into these negative representations, in a sense they kind of get reattached to people, that that's where we're stuck thinking right. about that negative relationship. And that um, we aren't able to really move forward with the intellectual production of black faculty and staff that are working so hard to, to transform this campus. Um, and that we're kind of, it takes us off the path of the really important work that is done by the people who are most negatively affected.